Hello all, Pastor Franklin here, and this is the second video in the installment that I am doing here at the church on Baptist doctrine. And today, what we're going to talk about is um, baptism and communion and how Baptists look at it, why we look at it that way. Uh, and as I get into it, I want to... Um, express two things. One, uh, just a reminder of why I'm doing this at, at the church here. Um, I, as I have said, I'm blessed with the congregation that God has sent me to. And a large part of that congregation uh, have come to us from other denominations. Um, we have people that have come from the Lutheran faith. We have people that have come from uh, the um, a Christian uh, church, uh, and I, they actually have another name, but I can't remember what it is. We have people that have come to us uh, from some Pentecostal backgrounds. And when I got here, I, I wasn't totally aware of that, and now having been here almost a year, uh, and having discussions, uh, people wanted to understand, well, why do we do certain things the way that we do? Why do we believe things the way we believe? And uh, I just thought that it was important to go back, and even for people who are lifelong Baptists, to review. Uh, I'm hoping that this, that this video series can also just be uh, something that helps people who are not Baptists to understand, well, why do we do things the way we do? Now, that being said, I don't want this to be seen as an attack on another uh, faith system's beliefs. Um, we are going to have our differences. Uh, I am a firm believer that when it comes to uh, the kingdom of God, uh, what is most important is that do you believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, that he bled and that he died and uh, he arose on the third day. And because of that, we have an opportunity for salvation. If you believe that, um, we can work around the other things where we disagree. So that being said, uh, the Bible study that I did just passed was um, on Baptist doctrine in terms of believers' baptism and communion. I think this series will probably go three or four uh, more lessons. We're going to look at the uh, Church Covenant. We're going to look at the Baptist Articles of Faith. We're going to look at some uh, other uh, important parts of Baptist belief. But today it's communion and baptism. And so I have some notes here. And, um, and part of that I'm going to just read to you because it's just easier. But the first thing to understand about Baptists, and I'm also going to tell you that I diverge a little bit in terms of how I see things, and I'll explain where I am there. Uh, we as Baptists look at uh, communion and baptism as ordinances, whereas other um, faith systems, such as my, our Methodist brothers and sisters, our Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Episcopals, our Catholics, uh, they look at them as sacraments. Uh, and what I have here is, a, again, we view it as an ordinance rather than a sacrament. Communion symbolizes our acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus and his gift of forgiveness and eternal life through his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. And that's how we look at it. Whereas in, in a sacramental system, it might actually be seen as a, a, a bestowing of grace. Now, with me... I'm in the middle and because I'm a little bit more sacramental than many Baptists would be because I, why I don't believe that grace is bestowed through baptism. I don't believe that grace is bestowed through communion. I do believe that it is a visible sign of God's grace. That communion is a visible sign of God's grace. That baptism is a visible sign of God's grace. And in that... Um, I guess I'm a little bit more sacramental than many of uh, my other uh, Baptist brothers and sisters. So let's start with communion because it's going to be the easiest because it's going to be the one where uh, many of our faith, sy faith systems will, um, will agree. Um, again, the, we, we look at the bread. Uh, the bread represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ. The fact that uh, he hung on a cross for us and that he gave of himself for us. And the 
uh, wine or grape juice, depending on your denomination, uh, represents the shed blood of Jesus. Again, he, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. He had nails placed in his hands and, and his feet. He had uh, his side pierced. He bled. And then through the shedding of that blood, the blood of an innocent lamb, the Lamb of God, uh, we have an opportunity to, uh, for salvation if we accept that free gift. Uh, and so when Jesus instituted this, he said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so different churches will celebrate communion at different times. And the tradition that I'm in and the church that I'm in, uh, we celebrate it on the first Sunday of every month. Uh, previously, I, I read the church constitution here. At some point in the past, they celebrated it quarterly. Um, so a lot of churches, especially more sacramental churches, celebrate it weekly. As a matter of fact, um, with our Catholic brothers and sisters, um, with Protestants, uh, we are a um, people of the word. So a lot of times our services will re revolve around the preached word. Not so with our Catholic brothers and sisters. The central part of the service is the receiving of God's table. It's, it's receiving of communion. Uh, and, but again, our, our belief system in terms of communion and what it represents uh, in terms of the elements of the communion are pretty much the same. Now, um, some uh, faiths I have known that will celebrate communion only once or twice a year. And there are advantages and disadvantages to all of those. First of all, uh, in terms of how we celebrate communion, it's important to know why. Um, uh, many Methodists and Baptists, because Methodists and Baptists, uh, although we have a, a different church structure, uh, our history is very parallel. Uh, because in the United States, the Methodists and Baptist churches were evangelizing pretty much at the same time. And many Methodists and Baptist churches celebrated communion quarterly. Well, there was a reason for that. There, there was no, there, there wasn't anything in terms of, of uh, belief of the church and all of that. But the reason it was celebrated quarterly is because that was how long it took a circuit rider. We, we have to remember that when uh, the church was growing in the United States, uh, we were still on horseback and um, pastors were given a circuit to ride and it took a quarter for the pastor to make that entire circuit. And that's why communion was celebrated quarterly. Um, and many churches still observe that. Uh, the thing is, there are advantages to how you celebrate it. Once, uh, for one, those who celebrate it more often, like for instance, weekly. Um, it is all, it's always before you. It's always there. The, the disadvantage of celebrating it more often, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, the disadvantage of celebrating it more often is the more often you celebrate it, the more it can simply become something rote, something that you, that you, it's just a part of service and you do it every week or every month or whenever. Uh, the advantage of celebrating it less, like for instance quarterly or twice a year or once a year, is that it becomes a very special thing. It becomes something uh, that maybe many people look forward to as they prepare to celebrate communion. It, it becomes, uh, it, it, there is no danger of it becoming rote. It, it, it's because uh, you look on, it's looked on as something that is rare. Uh, the disadvantage is one, uh, celebrating it less uh, means that you might have less people that are able to partake of it because of when it happens. Uh, for instance, a lot of people may do, a lot of churches may do communion during the Christmas holiday. Well, people travel during the Christmas holiday and may not be home. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both, but in terms of communion, I think that whether we are more sacramental or whether we are ordinance-based, that we pretty much have the same belief system in terms of uh, communion is important. The bread represents the broken body of Christ. The blood represents the wine or grape juice represents the blood. Um, in some cases, exactly whether that's a representation or whether it actually becomes 
the blood and body uh, are determined by your belief. Uh, but so that's where we are when it comes to uh, communion. Now let's get into the area where there will be a little bit more contention or disagreement, and that is baptism. As Baptists, we practice a believer's baptism. And basically, what does that mean? That means a person must be able to make a conscious, a conscious decision that is based on his or her belief in Christ before asking to be baptized. Baptism is not a means by which we receive God's saving grace. It is a symbol uh, that we have received God's saving grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and it is a public recognition. That is how we see it as a Baptist. And so, we do not baptize infants uh, in the Baptist faith. We don't baptize infants. Uh, other faiths do. We do not. And the reason we do not is because we believe that a person must be able to make a conscious decision. They must know that, okay, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died for my sins, and I want to publicly profess my belief in that faith. And so uh, another thing about Baptists is that um, we do baptism by immersion, which means that we don't, we don't sprinkle, we don't pour, we immerse. There are times when that can uh, be not done uh, for different reasons, such as health reasons, such as uh, reasons of practicality. But for the most part, we do baptize by immersion and we do believers baptism. Now, why, why is that? And, and where does the other side come off on that? Well, uh, we in the Baptist faith dedicate babies. So we, we bring babies before the church and we dedicate them back to God. Uh, the parents, the godparents, and the congregation all uh, come together and say that they will participate in making sure that this child is raised, um, learning the tenets of the faith. Uh, now, uh, we base that on uh, the dedication of Samuel. Uh, so we go back to the book of Samuel uh, for baby dedication uh, and say that that is why um, we do it. We also will say as Baptists that um, as we look and we study the scriptures, at no point do we see um, an infant baptism. Uh, now, to be fair to the other side, and I always believe in being fair to the other side, um, they have arguments for why they do what they do. Now, I will make it perfectly clear. I, I am a, a Baptist pastor. I will um, never baptize an infant. And in terms of children, we don't have a set age. Uh, you sit down, the parents sit down with the child, the pastor sits down with the child. And if we are convinced that they understand what they're doing, then the baptism takes place. If we don't, then we don't baptize. Now, uh, our brothers and sisters that do baptize infants will say, yes, I, we hear what you're saying, uh, Brother Baptist, but uh, there are uh, passages in the scriptures in which it says that uh, he and his entire family were baptized. Well, um, if his entire family were baptized, is there a possibility that there were infants there? Of course. Uh, the entire household, not only it, not, it meant wife, it meant children, it, it meant um, servants. And so they will say because of that, that that supports infant baptism. And uh, they have a, a decent argument there. Uh, but um, again, uh, we as Baptists believe that you need to be able to understand what is going on that the covering of the child um, up until the age of accountability, up until they um, can truly understand right from wrong, the, they, the covering is given by God, that they, they do receive that grace. Uh, and so um, we, do, we engage in believer's baptism. As a part of that then, what happens when a person comes to our church uh, and they did not receive believers baptism even uh, maybe they were of another faith that generally uh, we will want as a uh, as a reason as a tenant for church membership as a requirement for church membership uh, generally we will ask that they receive believers baptism because uh, we believe that a person should have that uh, public profession of faith through the believers baptism and so that's where we are um, that's just a brief under a brief of why we as Baptists do things the way that we do 
um, our belief in communion, our belief in believers' baptism. Uh, so our next video, we'll look at a few things that are other tenets of the Baptist faith. Have any questions or any comments? I invite you to please uh, post them.